This is Dr. Ricardo Comatar, Program Director at the University of Miami, and you're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Rick Comatar, Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Miami School of Medicine. He serves as the Director of the University of Miami Brain Tumor Initiative, Director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology at the University of Miami, Director of the UM Neurosurgery Residency Program, and director of the UM Surgical Neuro-Oncology Fellowship Program. Dr. Komatar is an internationally recognized leader in the field of brain tumors and performs nearly 700 procedures for these conditions each year using advanced cutting-edge surgical, radiosurgical techniques, making him one of the highest volume brain tumor surgeons in the world. His research interest includes clinical trial development and translational neuro-oncologic investigations designed to pioneer new therapies for brain tumors. Author of over 500 peer-reviewed scientific articles, book chapters, and invited editorials, Dr. Komatar has received research funding from the National Institute of Health, as well as other national and regional grants. He has served on the Executive Committee for the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and the Executive Board of the AANS-CNS Joint Section on Tumors. He is the founder and director of the annual neurosurgery charity softball tournament to benefit brain tumor research. He's a member of the Society of Neuro-Oncology and reviewer for both neurosurgery and the Journal of Neurosurgery. Dr. Komotar is also an Emmy nominated physician for his work on the series, Breakthrough Medicine. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon today. We have Dr. Rick Komatar. Dr. Komatar, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. Thinking back, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Uh, I think when people enter residency, they really want to be a great surgeon and a great doctor. I think that's everyone's priority, and that's the way it should be. As you start to master those surgical skills, your goals evolve to be more than just a doctor, but you also want to be a leader in the field. You want to be academic. You want to publish. You want to push the, push the field forward. Um, and you want to teach and you want to be a mentor. And so I think my goals started out very narrow. I want to be a, a, a very competent, safe, excellent surgeon, great doctor taking care of my patients, top-notch clinical care. And then over residency, that they evolved to be more than that. And I really wanted to be in a position where I can influence other surgeons and other trainees and really become a leader in the field. That's great. And then also with that too, when you went to the, the fellowship, what was, what was going through your mind as the interview process began as far as jobs are concerned? And how did that perspective change in the beginning years of your career? Uh, getting a job uh, as a surgeon can be very competitive. Uh, in the brain tumor market, which is what I was doing, I was trying to become an academic surgical neuro-oncologist. So I was going to become an academic brain tumor surgeon. The field is quite competitive. Yep. And there's only a handful of field jobs every year. And a lot of it really depends on timing. Timing is honestly 90 plus percent of getting a job. So it doesn't matter how good you are. If there's no job available at the university or the practice that you want, they're not going to make a spot for you. So you really have to be good and also... you have to have the right timing. So when I was in fellowship, I was applying for jobs. And just that main concern was, was the timing appropriate to get that job? I would say that, you know, I got lucky. I mean, obviously, I was very well trained, and I was working hard. Um, but you know, Miami happened to have an opening, whereas the year before they didn't. Um, I actually looked at fellowships and jobs at the same time. And I figured that if I had a great job offer, I, then I wouldn't do a fellowship. Um, and Miami, which I always wanted to come here because it's a great city. It's a very, very well-known department, excellent top-notch neurosurgery. Uh, I applied here prior to fellowship and they didn't have a job. I went to fellowship for whatever reason, they expanded and they had a job opening. So that's an example of how getting a job is really about timing more so than just how good you are. So applying for fellowships and jobs can kind of happen simultaneously. And the fellowship gives you a second round of applications. It's really good, great advice. I feel like a lot of candidates in that matter try to decide one or the other, but what you just said, I think should go a long way as far as allowing them to keep their minds open, options open all the way. Now, when you're going through that process within the brain tumor section, were you strictly focused on the academic route or were there any situations that could have presented a private practice route for you? Uh, I wanted to do academics since I you know, started residency. The best part of neurosurgery to me uh, is the teaching, it's the mentorship, it's dealing with the fellows, with the residents. Um, so I, some people love 
the idea of just going to work, operating, and then going home, and that's private practice. Uh, and that's great. It's just that I, I think I would have been bored in that situation, and I, I didn't just want to operate. I wanted to, as I said, do research, push the field forward, do kind of innovative techniques. Very difficult to do that in the private setting. Um, and so just going back to our other thing, you know, definitely recommend people who are, who are applying, look at jobs and look at fellowships. And I think that we can't really emphasize that enough because if you just look at a job, if you're off by a year, you're not getting that job. So the fellowship gives you basically two cycles. If you get the job you want, don't do the fellowship. If you, if you, if you don't get the job you want, then do the fellowship and that job may open up just like it did for me. Now, in regards to being a program director and thinking back from the early years of your career, what would you say were some of the keys to your personal success to getting into this role? Uh, I think you have to love it. I think it's like anything else. Um, I think if you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter if it's playing sports, law, business, medicine, doesn't matter. If you're passionate about something, you're going to be great at it. And my passion since day one was to, you know, you know, basically run a program, um, teach the residents, teach the fellows. And that was, that was a goal of mine, you know, day one that I got here to Miami. Uh, and so I think a big part of my success was it's something that I love to do and I'm very passionate about it. And it's, it's truly a priority for me. So that's a big thing. Um, and I also recommend never losing perspective. So a lot of people finish residency and they become an attending and overnight they just forget what it's like to be a resident. Um, and I think I will never forget what it's like to be a resident because it's, it's pretty hard. Uh, and I think maintaining that perspective and remembering what it's like to be a trainee, when you become an attending and you're now training people, it becomes a lot easier for you to like relate to them and understand the life of a resident. So never lose that perspective would be, would be a big, big lesson for people finishing training. Now on that topic of resident fellows and with your involvement with double ANS and CNS, what type of advice do you give to the graduating chief residents and fellows that you're working with? I, I tell them that if they want to do organized neurosurgery, uh, that they should get involved early. And this is yet another good kind of teaching point is that there's a lot of different aspects of academic neurosurgery, right? There is, there is, there is clinical care, taking care of patients operating. There is research and there's publishing. Uh, there's the administrative side. Uh, there's the educational side, there's the organized neurosurgery side, and you can't do everything. And the people who try to do everything in academic neurosurgery end up being good at nothing. And so, you know, I always tell our graduates, find the two or three things that you're really passionate about in, in neurosurgery, be it clinical care and research or research and mentorship or organized neurosurgery and mentorship, whatever it's going to be. Pick two or three of those that you really love and focus on those. So I always tell our graduates, if you want to do organized neurosurgery, do it early. But if it's not a passion of yours, that time can be better spent taking care of patients, teaching the residents, publishing, what have you. Uh, so I always say just if you're passionate, get started early. If you're not passionate, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste your time because time is limited. Yeah, passion is key to everything we do in life. And I'll also just think about as far as advice you have, you know, regarding building a practice and getting patients in. It's something that gets overlooked and not talked about as much. What is some of the information you provide to your residents and fellows on that topic? Uh, one of the most important topics um, that a resident or a fellow could possibly learn. Uh, as we talked about briefly prior, people spend seven, eight, nine years training in neurosurgery and all that time is devoted towards patient care. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong because that's the most important part of neurosurgery, but never is it once covered. How do you get the patients? You know how to take care of them, but you have no idea how to get the patients. And so people finish residency and they think, Oh, I've, I've done these fellowships. I trained at a Ivy league program. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to get all the patients and that's not true. And so my, my, my kind of lesson to the residents and fellows is that, you know, medicine is a business just like any other business and you have to be available, you have to be affable and you have to be able. So it's the three A's which apply to pretty much any business, any practice building. So the most important part of building a practice is you have to be available. People have to reach you. 
If you're relying on people just calling your office, faxing you information, never going to work. You got to, you know, in this day and age, it's everything's through the cell phone, phone calls, emails, texts. So you got to be available. If people can't reach you, it doesn't matter how good you are. No one's going to send you a patient. Um, then you have to be affable. People have to like working with you. There's a lot of people who aren't very good surgeons, but they're always available and they're affable and they get the patients. And finally, amazingly, least importantly, is really how good you are. Now, if you're good and you're affable and you're available, that's when you can really dominate the market. So I always tell people that you can't just rely on your skills because that's the least important part of building a practice. You have to be available. You have to be a pleasure to work with and you have to have good outcomes. That's great business advice. And I think sometimes in the academic setting, everyone's so focused on the education aspect, but when you get become a professional and look for that first job, it's really important that they understand these things going into the interview process and knowing what to talk about. Now, I think something's pretty cool is that you actually created a softball charity event. Can you kind of share some information about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I played college baseball back at Duke. Uh, and so I've always been into sports all my life. Uh, and when I was an intern um, up at Columbia, up in New York, we just started a friendly softball game, Central Park amongst four different um, neurosurgery departments, uh, Cornell, NYU, Columbia, and Mount Sinai. Wasn't a charity the first year. Everyone had a blast. The next year, we expanded. We went to eight teams. I invited Harvard and Penn and Yale and Hopkins. And at that point, there was a, there was a nexus. There was a kind of critical mass uh, and so we just took a shot and we basically just asked the Yankees if they would sponsor it. And there's a whole story behind that phone call, but I won't waste your time. But, um, but we eventually got the Yankees involved and we had George Steinbrenner donate um, and, you know, um, um, Alex Rodriguez, Jerry Seinfeld. And the next thing you know, um, it was a national fundraiser and it went from eight to 12 to 16. Now it's 40 te- actually 48 teams, uh, 48 team tournament. Uh, raises about $200,000 a year for brain tumor research. Um, It's about 700 neurosurgeons in Central Park playing softball uh, every year except for this year because of COVID. Uh, But we had 17 straight years. um, And we look on, you know, we look to pick it up again back in 2021, but it's a great event. Uh, It's the third largest event in, in, in neurosurgery. Um, And it's the, it's, it's the only event that's just social, no one's talking business and it's a great, it's a great uh, time for us to kind of be comrades and, uh, and, 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 you know, be very collegial. It's amazing that you started there. And just thinking of the whole COVID situation, how everything's moving to zoom, like we're doing now, it's all virtual, you know, initially residents and fellows could go to these conferences and, and rub shoulders with folks like yourself. Now they can't, what type of advice do you have for them so that they can maintain contact with guys like yourself and be able to reach out to neurosurgeons out there or even reach out for jobs if they can't meet them at conferences? Yeah, I mean, conferences, I think, are going to be a thing of the past until there's a vaccine. So, um, I, I mean, I, I, I guess the next best thing would just be communicating over email and, 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 and texting. So, my recommendation would be I wouldn't let the lack of conferences, uh, you know, kind of block you from reaching out. So, if you want to do a fellowship at a certain location and you want to reach out to that fellowship director, there is no harm in just emailing. At the very worst, they just don't even read it and they delete it. But trust me, I, I, I went through that. I applied for jobs. People deleted my emails. That's all part of the game. And then you just have to just, you know, be persistent, email them about a month later or three months later, and eventually they'll look at it and they'll get back to you. And so I don't think not having the conferences um, kind of deters people from, from kind of socializing. I think you have to find different ways to network. And I think email and texting is going to be the next way to do it. Also, you know, um, um, social media has become a huge avenue for networking. So I always tell our residents, start an Instagram account, start Twitter, start Facebook when you're an intern, because that needs to reflect you as a surgeon. And so social media um, is the next big thing. And I suspect that by the time in the next five or 10 years, Instagram is going to be the major way that doctors uh, promote themselves. Um, it's the major way that they get referrals. And so you have to start now and you have to really build a, you know, build, build a page that really reflects you as a surgeon accurately. We hope you enjoyed this episode of interview with the surgeon. 
Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.